Warsaw, Paris, Moscow. The great cities of Europe all fell like dominoes in one man's twisted game of world conquest. One after another, subjugated into an empire of darkness and malice. In the east, the Chinese desperately defend what they still hold on to. Midway has fallen to the Japanese, the American Pacific Fleet at the bottom of the sea. Britain and America stand defiant, but not for much longer. The year was 1944. With all of Europe and North Africa under the German heel, any possibility of victory started to seem like a dream in the minds of most Brits. Their will, which had stood so defiant for so long, began to crumble. Then, the Blitz began anew. With the entire Luftwaffe now being focused solely on Britain, the Royal Air Force was having more and more trouble keeping the endless wave of bombers at bay. Finally, after weeks of constant fighting, British air superiority was broken. London was brought to ruin once again. This time, no buildings were spared. The British Navy was bombed out of port into a channel swarming with German submarines and aerial bombardment. The Germans once again eyed the idea of a full-scale invasion of Britain. German troops gathered on the coast of France while the British attempted to fortify their southern coast though they were hindered by the constant bombing. Then, on a quiet morning in the late summer, one single German bomber flew over the city of London. And in an instant, the outline of the city was replaced with the outline of a mushroom cloud. What was left of Parliament gave in to the German demands for unconditional surrender shortly after. The bombing stopped, and the German army occupied England. The war for Europe was finally over. In the Pacific, the Japanese continued their bombing of Hawaii. The Americans, shaken by the news of London, began to question how worth it continuing this war truly was. It was at this point that the newly victorious Germans saw an opportunity to secure their hegemony over the northern Atlantic. An ultimatum was sent to Washington on New Year's Eve. Recognize German control over Iceland and Greenland, demilitarize the northern Atlantic, and recognize Japanese control over all seas land. Accept and you can keep Hawaii. Deny and what happened to London will be in your future. The Americans were out of options. They agreed to the terms. With the remainder of the Chinese nationalist and communist forces retreating into the mountains, World War II was over and the Axis had emerged victorious. And so, with the war over, it was time for the victors to shape the world to their will. Let's begin with Europe, and with Germany, who throughout the war had fully annexed Austria, the Sudetenland, vast swathes of Poland, alsace lorraine and Luxembourg directly. Bohemia remained an all but fully integrated part of the Reich. Then we have the Reich's commissariats and direct puppet regimes, the general government in what was once Poland, Reich's Commissariat to Benelux, Norwegian, Ukraine, Ostland, Caucasus, and Moscovin. The Vichy regime in France, and Oswald Mosley's England. Then we have the Reichs further out and looser controlled states in Scotland, Turkestan, and Kazakhstan. Siberia devolved into constant warring states, constantly being played against one another by the Germans and Japanese. Now, the Italians in Europe. Mussolini was able to directly annex Corsica, most of the Dalmatian coast, and Albania, with Serbia and the Hellenic Republic becoming puppets. Now we can look at Africa and the Middle East. The Italians took all of Egypt, the Levant, and Syria, along with British Somaliland and French Djibouti, as well as strongly influencing Iraq and the newly formed Arabian Federation under the House of Saud. While Tunisia was granted to the Italians, Algeria was controversially maintained under French rule by the Germans. 
This was the first major stain on Italian-German relations. Morocco was granted to Franco's Spain, who also quickly invaded and incorporated Portugal into a Neo-Iberian Federation. The Congo, as well as most surrounding territories, were incorporated into a German supercolony in Central Africa. South Africa became a puppet state of the Germans as well. We can now turn back to Asia, where the Japanese stand as the regional hegemon. All islands seized from the Americans were kept by the Japanese. Previously, French Indochina as well as Malaya were integrated as well. Manchukuo, under Asian Gairo Puyi, annexed the greater Manchurian region. However, the fallen emperor was never given back his Chinese empire as he was promised. A Mongol puppet state stood to the north of China, which had itself become a subject under the Japanese puppet leader Wang Jingwei. The Philippines, Indonesia, and Burma, all Japanese puppets while the Republic of India gained its independence from Britain, just to be heavily influenced economically and politically by the Japanese. The New World Order was set up, with only the humiliated Americans with their Canadian allies standing apart. The Japanese, the chosen people of Asia, finally achieved their domination over the continent, and it was domination. The empty promises of harmony and peace between all Asian nations were indeed empty. In Malaya, all resources were directly controlled by Japan, as Japanese-filled industrial towns sprung up all across the colony. In China, the reorganized nationalist government had almost no political control, bending to the will of the Japanese army. Japanese businesses used China's vast population as an endless source of cheap labor. In Indonesia, the Philippines, and Burma, a class system formed with the Japanese at the top and the natives at the bottom. Initial cooperation with the natives of Indochina broke down as more land was needed for Japanese settlement, some even calling the land New Japan. In Korea, the brutal occupation continued and even worsened as the peninsula was directly integrated into Japan, Koreans being slowly phased out in favor of Japanese migrants. The Japanese economy boomed. With the resources of all of Asia available to them, their navy tripled in size, patrolling the Pacific Ocean, their new domain. In Mongolia and Manchuria, a crisis developed. Masses of Russian refugees fleeing the constant warfare and instability left behind by the fallen Soviet Union poured over the border. Russians found themselves at the bottom of the social structure, sanctioned from even ever setting foot in Japan proper being forced onto the unwanted land in the north. The Kuomintang were never truly defeated. They escaped into the mountains and desert to the east of the Japanese effective control. The Ma clique took them in as they launched guerrilla attacks against the reorganized government as well as ever-defiant communists in the north. After the Great War, the Japanese found themselves arguably the most powerful nation in the world, coming to rival the German Reich in their sheer might. Germany who was just starting to begin their own major project. Hitler had finally achieved his ideological goal. All of Eastern Europe was under his empire. The final solution, starting in 1941, was only the beginning. These vast lands weren't empty. Something that would need to change if they were to be filled with the Germans and integrated directly into the Reich. Only a few years after the end of the war, the true final solution would begin. Millions upon millions of Poles, Ukrainians, Baltic Slavs, Belarusians, and Russians were rounded up, villages empty, all set for slave labor and extermination. Almost immediately as the lands were empty, Germans began to settle them. The world was shocked as the rumors and tales of the millions of deaths began seeping out of the Reich. This was the final goal of the Nazi party. The destruction of Eastern Europe. The extermination of the Slavs. Germany had her Lebensraum. And the largest extermination program of all times marched on. But the people of Eastern Europe weren't going down without a fight. As it became more and more clear, the aim of the Reich was to clear out the entire populace of their eastern territories, resistance began. The Wehrmacht, 
believed to be the most powerful fighting force on the planet, had already succumbed to bureaucracy and overextension. The situation escalated quickly. Unrest became conflict, which became rebellion, which became revolt. In the early 1950s, the entirety of the German holdings in the east of the Reich fell into anarchy. But this was only the beginning. The Nazi economy, completely built off of debt, couldn't adapt to the times of peace. During the late 1940s, the industry of Germany was facing a crisis, and when the Great Eastern Revolts began, it couldn't handle the new strain. It was finally clear the German Nazi party would not be able to pay off their debt. The bubble burst. The largest businesses in Germany began bankrupting left and right. Unemployment skyrocketed. The party attempted to pour millions of marks into their debt pool, but this only led to mass inflation. The German mark was once again worthless. It was at this point, when it seemed things were at their worst, the Fuhrer, long sickly, fell fatally ill and died. The party couldn't survive the crisis. No successor could fix the situation. The German government collapsed in full. The nations of the world closed their borders as millions of German refugees flooded out from what was once the A Thousand Year Reich, not even reaching 30. Hitler's dream was dead, millions along with it. What remained of his Europe fell to revolution shortly after, as the Americans attempted to somehow stabilize the situation and assert themselves in the continent. But this would take decades to fix, if it even could be. The world would never be the same.